Hello and welcome to the lecture on urinary tract infection. This is chapter 45 in the MedSearch book. So inflammation of the urinary tract may be caused by a variety of disorders, but bacterial infection is by far the most common. Asymptomatic bacteria does not justify screening or treatment except for in pregnant women. Normally the bladder and its contents are free of bacteria in healthy people, um, but the pregnant patient is considered compromised or immunocompromised. So we would treat that patient, um, but if we had some colony forming units in a healthy adult, we, it doesn't necessarily that mean that we would treat them, especially as we go through and talk about the symptoms of UTI. So like I said, the etiology of a, of a urinary tract infection is usually caused by a bacteria. And it happens when the defense mechanisms that are used to maintain sterility of the bladder above the urethra is altered. So any alteration in these defense mechanisms increases the risk of getting that UTI. So these defenses include those that are written on the, on the screen here, um, such as having an acidic pH less than six, making sure that the, you know, our bladder will completely empty, um, and having a high urea concentration. Table 45.2 in the book talks about our list of factors that predispose a person for UTI. Um, and these predisposing factors include any factors that increase urinary stasis. And that could be like urinary retention would might be a reason why we're having stasis in the bladder, which can cause bacteria to grow and live. Um, another risk factor is foreign bodies. And in another slide, we talk, we'll talk about um, calculi or stone formation. And so that foreign body or indwelling catheters is a huge one for foreign bodies will increase the risk. Anatomic factors include um, defects like fistula or um, congenital, you know, defects that cause obstruction those can increase stasis and then factors compromising our immune system like having a, a full-blown HIV infection or diabetes mellitus those will alter our immune response can increase the risk for UTI as well as any functional disorders um, such as having um, avoiding dysfunction will increase our risk for stasis. E. coli is the most common pathogen causing UTI. It's primarily seen in women. Uh, most infections are due to this gram-negative bacilli, which is normally found in the GI tract, although some gram-positive organisms such as streptococci, enterococci, and staphylococcus saprophyticus can also cause urinary tract infections. Usually we will see the signs and symptoms of UTI when there's 10 to the fifth colony forming units per mil when we look at our um, UA with reflex, but sometimes counts lower than that can show a clinical manifestation of UTI. Sometimes fungal and parasitic infections can cause UTIs and there are at-risk patients for different type of fungal and parasitic infections. Cotti is the most common healthcare associated infection. And Cotti is a catheter associated urinary tract infection. That's what that stands for. And this is usually caused by E. coli and Pseudomonas. And what is special about Cotti is that normally the bladder doesn't have any kind of like homogenous etiology or nothing really comes kind of from the body. Um, but an ascending infection, infection, the risk is increased when we have those indwelling objects or any instrumentation like having a cystoscope or a cystoscopy done and having instrumentation of the urethra. It can kind of push that bacteria that's normally around um, the perineal area into the sterile um, distal urethra and bladder. Also, sexual intercourse can increase the risk of ascending infection um, because of the the pushing in the passage of the bacteria up the tract and there can be microscopic damage to the urethra um, from intercourse that would of course give the opening for the infection to grow.
There's a picture here of our urinary tract, and so our upper urinary tract includes the kidney, uh, the ureters, the renal parenchyma, and the renal pelvis. And when we have upper urinary tract infection, this usually causes fever, 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 um, flank pain, and chills. So those are very characteristic of our upper UTI, and we'll look more at that when we look at pyelonephritis. Um, which is an inflammation of that renal parenchyma and in the collecting system in the ducts versus the lower urinary tract infection, which usually has no systemic manifestation. So we don't really see flank pain there. We see um, lower urinary tract symptoms like hesitancy, urgency, dysuria, um, cloudy appearance from from sediment we see more of those type symptoms and that's from a, a problem with either emptying um, or storing and so those are caused by inflammation of the bladder cystitis or inflammation of the urethra um, however of course nothing is true and you know 100 percent in medicine so we can have those lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs um, even with our upper urinary tract infections we have a couple different classifications of UTI, and they're uncomplicated, which is an otherwise normal urinary tract and usually only involves a cystitis or inflammation of the bladder versus complicated. So we have a comorbidity with our complicated UTI, um, which is obstruction or stones, you know, causing the stasis or damage there catheters instrumentation that puts us into a complicated uti underlying health conditions such as diabetes um, or resistance to the antibiotics and pregnancy like we talked about earlier that kind of puts us into a range of complicated uti because of the immunocompromised um, nature of pregnancy the individual with a complicated infection is at risk for pyelonephritis urosepsis and renal damage so urosepsis is a urinary tract infection that has spread systemically. So it's gone system-wide, it's gotten into the bloodstream, and it's causing havoc all over our system. And this can be life-threatening in that it causes a massive vasodilation, um, leaky vessels, a hypovolemia, and um, a hypoxia to the tissues. And we do need emergent treatment for urosepsis. So clinical manifestations of our urinary tract infection can range from um, mild to severe. And so mild would be more of those LUTs, like lower urinary tract symptoms. That's table 45.3 that I keep referring to on page 1035. Um, to severe um, symptoms associated more with urosepsis, like the fever, um, very bad back pain, lower abdominal pain, um, or those pyelonephritis type symptoms like flank pain, fever, uh, like pain, fever. I can't think of my third one, but it'll come back later. So, like I said, LUTs or lower urinary tract symptoms are experienced in patients who have UTIs of the upper and lower urinary tract. So, the we call it lower urinary tract symptoms because it's happening um, at the at the bladder or lower bladder and urethra because it occurs from a problem with emptying or a problem with storage and sometimes the urine can even contain um, blood so we call that hematuria um, which which is going to turn our, our urine red or sometimes it can be very cloudy and that's from the sediment or all of the little white blood cells and bacteria that's kind of coming out um, so we see changes in our urine actual colors so some bladder storage um, symptoms are frequency urgency incontinence or leaking nocturia and nocturial enuresis bladder emptying symptoms are going to be problems with hesitancy you know difficulty starting the stream a weak stream dribbling after voiding urinary retention and difficulty voiding or dysuria people with significant bacteria might not have any symptoms 
or they might have nonspecific symptoms such as fatigue or anorexia. Um, because older adults are less likely to experience a fever with UTI, a value of body temperature um, as an indicator of UTI is unreliable. And what we usually look at with these older adults is that third bullet point there, the cognitive impairment. We see a lot of confusion in patients that come in with UTI, older patients that come in with UTI, and then test their urine and see that. So in a patient suspected of having UTI, initially we're um, going to do a dipstick urinalysis. So this is kind of after, after an HNP and them telling us about the symptoms that they're having. And so this can identify different um, pieces uh, like nitrates, white blood cells, and a leukocyte esterase, which would be indicative of uh, of a UTI. So if we have nitrates in our urine, this is in, going to indicate the bacteriuria because it's the, the waste product of bacteria metabolism. Um, white blood cells tell us that there's some infection going on and leukocyte esterase is going to be present um, with pyuria. So we're going to see it with like the bacterial um, infection there. These findings then are confirmed by a microscopic analysis, and we also usually do a reflex to culture, um, especially if they're complicated or healthcare-associated UTIs from the catheter, um, or they're frequently reoccurring UTIs, so more than two or three per year. We also might culture our urine if we're, say, treating the UTI with what we normally would treat with, but yet the patient is still having symptoms. Um, then we would want to culture and make sure that we are on the right track and treating the right infection. To get these UAs, um, we do want to make sure that we are getting a good sample. So we do prefer that clean catch sample. And so in women, um, we usually have to have a couple wipes. So we want to teach them to spread back the labia and wipe from front to back, you know, using that little wipe, throw that one away and then wipe again. Um, because if we don't clean that perennial area, that normal flora, uh, around the perennial area can give false positive results. Also the clean catch, we want to urinate into the toilet for uh, like one or two seconds and then start catching it in the cup. For men, uh, it's a bit easier, um, but we'll just have them wipe the glands around the urethra and same thing, pee a little bit and then start peeing in the cup. Um, also, if you are collecting it and can't send it to a lab right away, you do wanna put the urine on ice. Sometimes an ultrasound or a CT scan can be done um, if we're thinking that the cause of the UTI is from obstruction, um, you know, cancer or inflammation, whatever, um, or we're having recurrent UTIs. So how to treat um, the drug therapy is summarized on table 45.4. Um, but antibiotics, because it's mostly um, E. coli or bacteria that's causing these UTIs. And so antibiotics are, are used, you know, almost 100% of the time. So for uncomplicated cystitis, so again, we don't have any of those risk factors and we just have some lower urinary tract infections, we do a three-day um, antibiotic course. For complicated UTIs, it's much longer, um, one or two weeks, kind of depending on the drug that we use and the um, complications that we have. And so first choice is to use like Bactrim or Timethoprim sulfamethoxol <laughs> um, for our uncomplicated. And then for our complicated, a common one we use is nitrofurantoin or macrodantin or the phosphomycin. So here are those drugs um, that I just labeled. So that first on the left, the Timethoprim sulfamethoxol. Saxol, goodness, um, brand name is Bactrim. I should have put that in parentheses. But we use this commonly for our uncomplicated or first time UTI because it's relatively inexpensive and it only needs to be taken twice a day. So it's going to have a better um, follow through for the patient to take it until it's all gone. 
Um, disadvantage of the Bactrim, um, which is becoming an increasing problem, is we have seen some E. coli resistance there. Other drug options are fluoroquinolones like Cipro for our complicated UTIs and the Macrodantin or Nitrofurantoin for our complicated UTIs. Um, however, there are some drug alerts or complications with the Macrodantin, such as uh, photosensitivity. So we do want to tell our patients to avoid sunlight, wear sunscreen, uh, wear protective clothing, um, and increase risk for allergy with the Nitrofurantoin. So watching out for, um, you know, cough, dyspnea, rash, fever, chills, those things. A low dose of that Bactrim nitrofurantoin or another antibiotic um, might be administered on a daily basis in an attempt to prevent recurring UTIs. Um, or sometimes we can, if, if a patient has easily UTIs or treated many times for UTI, they can take a single dose um, before something that might cause the UTI, such as sexual intercourse, to prevent it from happening. Lastly, antifungals that we would treat if it is a fungal infection would be amphotericin or fluconazole. There is one drug that um, acts as a coating kind of on the urethra. Um, this is the phenazopyridine, and it's a dye that's excreted in a urine, and it, it has a like analgesic or a pain-relieving effect on that mucosa of the urinary tract. However, we really want to make sure that our patients know if they're using this drug as a pain, you know, if we prescribe this drug, their um, pee is going to be stained. It's going to be like a bright orange to red color. Um, and it can stain like the toilet if they let it sit there. Um, but it definitely, if they're having some dribbling, it can stain uh, their underwear as well. So assessment of the patient with UTIs is you know, taking that history. So kind of going back a few slides here, um, but seeing if they have previous UTIs or other complications that would predispose them for urinary tract infections. And again, those are on table 45-2. Ask if they, what antibiotics they're on, um, might give us a hint uh, if they've had UTIs in the past. See if they have a catheter, if they've had a recent cystoscopy. Um, ask about hygiene. Um, and, and then ask about the symptomology of the lower urinary tract symptoms, LUTs, or possible pyelonephritis, which is that fever, chills, and flank pain. So some things we might see are fever. We usually see that more with the upper urinary tract infections, like the pyelonephritis. We usually don't see it with just a plain, uncomplicated UTI or cystitis. Um, we might notice, uh, like I said, hematuria, and then looking at our UA, we'll see different um, positive findings for bacteria, such as the positive nitrates, positive leukocyte esterase, and what WBCs in the urine. So our goal is to have relief of those LUT symptoms. Um, no upper urinary tract involvement. We don't want it to turn into pyelonephritis, and we don't want any recurrency of the UTI. So health promotion for patients with UTI is to let them empty their bladder completely, um, reduce complications so there isn't so much straining, wiping and having good hygiene, and then you having good liquid or fluid intake to kind of flush through. So if um, a person is 150 pounds, they should have about 75 ounces of liquid each day. Uh, so we do want to encourage them to be drinking lots of water. And then, of course, recognizing any individuals that are at risk, such as those immunocompromised um, and older adults. It is thought that cranberry juice or the enzymes found in cranberries inhibit um, the attachment of urinary pathogens like E. coli to the bladder epithelium. So a lot of times we can say that cranberry juice or cranberry tablets might reduce the number of UTIs and they can, um, you know, just buy regular cranberry juice or they know they have, there's some pills at certain pharmacies. Um, routine thorough perennial hygiene is important, especially for our hospitalized patients. So having a, a plan when there is an instrument in um, for catheterization. And I encourage you to look at the American Nurses Association County Prevention Tool that I've added um, to help go over some of those cares and safety for um, Foley catheters. 
And so on that sheet, it talks about avoidance of unnecessary catheterization. So the CDC actually only has six recommendations for reasons a patient should have a Foley catheter. And I can tell you they're used a lot more um, than what those six reasons are. We want to remove them early. So some facilities have nursing driven protocols to remove these catheters um, and uh, recath kind of policies on when it should go back in. Um, aseptic technique is a must for insertion and clean clean maintenance. You know, hand washing, using a separate container, not letting it fall on the bed, um, using gloves. And again, the American Nurses Association offer, offers this um, cauti prevention tool that's evidence-based and up-to-date to really help prevent um, that healthcare-associated infection. Lastly, in the acute care of a patient with a UTI, first off, we want to make sure that we have good fluid intake. Um, we want it, it helps dilute the urine, and then that's going to help with the LUTs, the lower urinary tract infection, and make it feel a bit better. It also can flush out that bacteria so they don't colonize and grow on the endothelium. We want to avoid um, triggers that are going to cause like bladder spasms and increase the pain there. And those include like caffeine, alcohol, carbonated beverages. Uh, it's just going to irritate it more. Um, a warm shower or sitting in a tub of, of warm water filled above the waist, that's called a sitz bath. So, you know, sitting our bottom in warm water. That also may um, help with some temporary relief um, for the patient. So we want to make sure that our patient uh, monitors for signs of improvement, has decreased um, cessation of symptoms. Um, but we do want to always tell them to fully complete their antibiotic treatment, even if they're feeling better. Okay, so even if they feel better by day two, keep going through the whole seven days so that we don't have that uh, resistance form grow. Um, but we do want them to let us let us know if they still have symptoms and the antibiotic treatment is done. We might need to do another urine culture to make sure we're treating the right thing. We want them to let us know if symptoms get worse, like they have flank pain, fevers, and chills, um, as that would be a sign of ascending infection into the upper urinary tract, which we would call pyelonephritis. And for sending the patient home, again, take the drug as ordered, take all the doses, drink lots of fluid, make sure you're emptying your bladder, um, good hygiene, and um, have good follow-up care if you have symptoms that are, that are recurring. So if we do everything right and everything goes as planned, right, our patient with the UTI, again, will have a good elimination pattern, will have no LUTs, um, symptoms and they're going to take their medications as needed. Thank you.